You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with the healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am one of your hosts, Cameron Steinheimer, and I am the marketing manager here at Pacific Companies. Hello and welcome everybody to the Doc Lounge podcast by Pacific Companies. I'm your host, Stacey Doyle, Senior Director of Marketing. I want to thank you all for tuning into our Providers Perspective series. This series focuses on a physician's journey through medicine and the learnings and advice they would give to their peers and upcoming physicians. Our special guest today on the Providers Perspective is Dr. Sylvia Gray, a hand and plastic surgeon. Dr. Gray is the Department Chair of Surgical Specialties and Section Chair of Plastic Hand Pain ENT and Orthopedics at Mercy in Oklahoma. And I'm also joined by my co-host, who is Callie Keeney. She's the Business Development Consultant at Pacific Companies. I want to welcome you both to the podcast. Thank you, Stacey, for having us on. Happy to be here. And I would love to learn a little bit more about you guys' connection and and how you both came to know each other. Um, Well, it's a good story. And so I feel like we tell it not infrequently. Um, People always wonder why I am in Oklahoma. And um, I was born in Bolivia and I grew up in Kentucky. Um, I did my training all over the place in Boston, Houston, and I was the last in Miami for my hand fellowship. Um, And when I was looking for a job, I had done a plastic surgery residency and orthopedic hand fellowship, and I wanted to do a lot of both. And oftentimes, you can go into hand surgery as an orthopedic resident or as a plastic surgery resident. And, um, and then when you come out, there's jobs in within like orthopedic groups that you can do a lot of hand. It's a lot, it's difficult to do plastic surgery within that uh, kind of setup. And then there's other jobs, plastic surgeons, about 60% of plastic surgeons go into solo private practices and they just do a lot of plastic surgery but it's hard to do hand surgery in that setup. And so when I was looking, I looked all over um, and Callie had, she was at the time um, a recruiter for Mercy, Oklahoma. Um, and she had, I, I think I found a, a posting for you and I called you and I said, hey, tell me about the job. And so she told me about, it was a hand surgery job, but I was like, you know, I really want a good mix of things. And she said, okay, I'm going to make that happen. And, um, and so she, um, at the time, the president of our Oklahoma hospital was a general surgeon and he just was very, he was like a visionary. He had, he said, you know what, if this is what you want to do, we can, we can figure it out. We've never had a plastic surgeon, but we can figure it out. Um, and I said, okay. So I came up here and interviewed. You said, okay, great. <laughs> By the way, I'm nine months pregnant and I need to interview in one week. <laughs> and I said, okay, we'll make that happen. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, cause I only, I could only fly until 37 weeks. And so I had one week to be here and um, I was very pregnant, like very, very pregnant. And so I didn't want to catch anyone off by surprise. Like there was no hiding this, that that was the case. So, um, so it was February. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I had been in this Miami weather that, you know, and I had no winter clothes, um, no, none that fit especially. Yeah. Um, and so she picks me up and I was like, wow, it's cold here. (laughs) Not only was it cold, I believe we were under a blizzard warning which i swear never happens here in oklahoma it's very very rare but of course the day my candidate from miami was in town we happened to be having a actual blizzard we had to pull over multiple times as we were driving around for her site visit and community tour because the windshield wipers kept freezing (laughs) to the windshield and i'd have to get out scrape them off and uh, i thought there's actually no way this 
brilliant woman from Miami is going to come after uh, seeing this. But, but I mean, I think the job and I mean, Callie it was obviously a very good recruiter. Um, and, you know, I think the, the the fact that I could do what I wanted was the selling point and the rest could, you know, get figured out. And, and it, it's held true to, to this day. Um, I've gotten to kind of shape my practice exactly how I want it. Um, and I think that's, I think that, and that's why I've stayed for so long. I'm here coming up on 10 years. Um, it's my first job out of fellowship. Um, and I think the the thing that people talk about when they talk about burnout or when they talk about not having good job satisfaction is not having much control of what your life and what your job looks like. Um, and that has been the opposite. Um, I think I've had a lot of say in what my job looks like throughout this time. Um, which keeps you motivated. And that's a testament to the leadership here at Mercy and the administration who followed through on the promises they made to you during the recruitment process and continue to involve their physicians in uh, leadership roles. And um, it's worked yeah. out. Yeah. And now our kids uh, <laughs> are on the same sports teams and we hang out together all the time. So yeah. <laughs> I'm very glad she's from that, from that day of, of horrible weather, friendship was formed. That's right. And it sounds like really a, a real partnership between, you know, a recruiter from an amazing health organization like Mercy um, and a physician like yourself. And I think, Dr. Gray, hearing you speak, it it is really powerful for our listeners because you use the power of what you wanted and knew that, hey, this is something that, you know, would be the perfect, you know, dynamic for me in my career. Let me go ahead and ask and and see if this is something that can happen. What kind of gave you that, you know, courage or that strength to follow through with what would really make you most happy? Well, I mean, I think it was mostly that at the, at the time, you know, we do so much training. You're doing six years of plastic surgery residency and then a year to specialize. And it, I I didn't feel ready to say, well, I'm just going to give up, you know, this much of my training and be and be super focused. And, you know, some people know that ahead of time, um, which is great. And I really just wanted a very broad practice. Um, and I think that now on this end of things, I've been able to recruit two other plastic hand surgeons that have the exact same practice that I do and that love it. They love the breadth of it. Um, so I think it's more about just not having wanting to give up what I was doing and then finding people who are supportive of it. Love that. And would love to learn a little bit more about your day to day. And I know we have some, you know, listeners that are, you know, just starting medical school, trying to figure out kind of what their specialty is. Tell me a little bit more about what you do and what, what makes you love it. Um, so I have a practice that's about 50% hand surgery. Um, and it's, uh, I would say my most, um, uh, it, it brings surprises every day. You never know what you're going to get. Um, I, there's things that are common like carpal tunnel and arthritis. And then there's injuries that occur, knife injuries here in Oklahoma. We have roping injuries and oil rig injuries, um, gunshot wounds. And so I, I chose this the field of the specialization in hand surgery because you get to do everything. You get to do fracture work, you get to do bone, um, like little kids, congenital, so from little kids to adults, um, nerves, arteries, tendons. It's really one of the few places where one surgeon does everything. Um, and that's part of the reason I chose the hand surgery. And I like doing something different every day. Um, I like the, the unexpected and the unknown of it. Um, it does come like with anything with its own um, difficulties, I guess, in the sense that um, when you're on call, I mean, you can be up all night long operating and 
those cases are usually the most fun and the most interesting, but they often, these, you know, gunshot wounds or fireworks injuries, they're always at one in the morning. They never occur during the day. Um, and so I think that's hard as far as just uh, trying to figure out how you do the rest of your life. But I also have a practice where I do a lot of reconstruction. Um, and so that entails, I guess, like filling holes. So if a dermatologist or a Mohs surgeon, a cancer surgeon um, has to take out a skin cancer and you get a hole on your cheek or your scalp or your nose, I fix it by doing different things like flaps, skin grafts. Um, I do that all over the body, but um, I, I enjoy fixing defects in the face the most. Um, and again, I think it's kind of the same theme. It's never the same. It's never the same surgery. It's never the same defect, um, which I think is fun. Keeps you on your toes um, day to day. And then I do some cosmetic work, which includes facelifts, tummy tucks, breast augmentation, things like that. So you, you do the gamut. I, I, that's so fascinating. And, and it's interesting to hear about, you know, every day is different. I could see how that would be really, really exciting. Um, what I wanted to ask you is hearing about all of the different, you know, cases that you may have per day sounds, you know, to be really exciting. Is there a piece of, you know, of your work that really makes it rewarding for you? Um, I, I, th I think the best part of my job is that um, it's almost like immediate satisfaction. You break a bone and we can fix it. Um, I think some of the most devastating injuries and, you know, seeing these patients for years, a lot of the ones that have like fireworks injuries, um, I mean, they're devastating injuries. And, you know, to be able to give that person function at the end of these devastating injuries. Um, it may not be what they started with, but, uh, you know, after several surgeries, we get them to, to a hand that is able to continue daily life. Um, I think those are, that those are, those are my favorite patients that, you know, really I've seen go through I've had a couple of young patients who, had ATV injuries and lost fingers, and we had to do multiple operations. And I see them through their graduations and through college, and it's it's really amazing what people do. And you know, these are these are injuries that at the at the time can create a lot of um, a lot of difficulty for the patient. But seeing them at the end and seeing how much they've persevered is really it, it's really rewarding. That, that sounds incredibly fulfilling to see them on the other side and, and, you know, from your work, be able to, you know, live, live and have a high quality of life. Um, really quick, just tell, you know, I think awareness is always good on certain topics. Let us know. I mean, it sounds like fireworks are something that, you know, we still have, you know, quite common in this country, especially, especially around our days of, you know, celebration. Tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've seen and what people should be aware of. Oh, I am happy to do so. Um, to anybody who wants, I share pictures just because I think pictures are worth a million words. But, and, you know, fireworks are very dangerous. Um, the most common types of injuries I see are when people think that they've got a dud firework. It hasn't gone off. They don't douse it with water. They go, they try to pick it up thinking that it just isn't working and then it explodes. And when I say explodes, I mean, it takes fingers completely off. It rips through the hand. It, they are terrible, high impact injuries. Um, the other types of injuries are uh, with mortar shells and uh, these rockets that they light in their hand purposely, and then they misfire. And then instead of going into the air, they explode in their hands. The Roman candles. The right? Roman candles. Yep. Um, and then, so those are the big devastating injuries, but I also see burns and sparklers are not benign. Um, they go up to 10,000 degrees. And so even the sparks from them, not the actual sparkler themselves can create terrible burn injuries. Um, and oftentimes, you know, these are little kids running around and um, 
I, I think it, they are, what I tell people is they you have to always keep a lot of close eye on, on kids when they have this and adults sometimes, you know, um, because they can create terrible burns. That is a really good PSA for, <laughs> for everybody. And, um, you know, I think it's an important topic. Um, I want to shift gears here a little bit. I want to learn and, and have our audience learn how you really stay up to date with, with trends and, and what's latest um, within, obviously, your specialty. Um, I think that one of the most important things is being engaged in learning. Our fields are constantly changing, some fields kind of more rapidly than others. Um, but uh, within our own community here in Oklahoma, we have a journal club uh, that we meet once a month and we go over the latest articles. Um, we do that with the fellows here and all the other community hand surgeons, which is awesome because you get kind of perspectives from an academic center, you get a perspective from high volume private practices, you get the fellows in there. Um, we have some retired hand surgeons that come which is also adds a, a, a great perspective to why is this so different than what we did 30 years ago? Um, so things like that. Also taking the time to go to conferences. Um, I just went to the Canadian uh, plastic surgery conference and I said it this weekend, you never regret going. It is always hard to get out of your work and your surgical schedule and your family commitments. Um, but you, there's always something to learn for everyone. Um, and so I think just remembering that um, is worthwhile. And also, I mean, not just for your uh, surgical practice, but I also uh, have a leadership role in our hospital system and going to conferences and I've gotten a, um, a certificate uh, in, in surgical leadership, which is a year long course, it's a Harvard course that teaches you how to be a leader, uh, how to manage people. Um, it has lots of other components, but the other kind of hats that I play in, in our administration, you never learn how to do any of that in medical school. Um, and so going and being taught by people who this is like, that, you know, this is what they do and they do it well, um, I think has helped a lot in, in learning how to look at finances for a hospital, for example, um, and being able to talk with uh, our financial people in the same language. I think there's nothing better than to be able to go and educate yourself on those things. That's an invaluable tip, I think, for, you know, anyone listening about ways that you've just, you know, stayed ahead of the curve and really continue to educate yourself um, on things, you know, obviously beyond, you know, what you learned in medical school to help with your leadership position. For those that are interested in maybe, you know, also taking on, you know, leadership role or, or going the, you know, a, on a leader path. How did that come about for you? And, and, you know, what inspired you to take on those roles as well? I, I think, I think the, it started because I, I like being involved in the decision-making. Um, hospital systems are, have a lot of moving parts and oftentimes what comes down, big hospital systems like ours, especially have a lot of layers. And what comes down to you is, you have to do it this way, or you can't do that, or we can provide this, but not that. And you're left thinking like, well, that's kind of silly because in my head, X, Y, or Z makes more sense. But realistically, there's been so much more that has gone into that. And um, and I I like not only knowing that, but I like being part of it. Um, and, I, and it really started with, and what I encourage everyone to do with things that really matter to you. Um, for example, I really felt that we could be more efficient with our block time in the operating room, like how time is divvied up between all the surgeons. Um, and I think it makes you as a surgeon more efficient, makes your time more valuable. It also makes the system work better. And so one of the first things that I got involved with is participating in things like block committees. Um, and then, you know, you're involved in one committee and 
you get asked, do you want to participate in this other committee? And I think that you don't, you're not trying to add things to your plate just to add them, but if they interest you, say yes, um, because then you can figure out, you know, what that committee is all about. And that's really how my leadership role at Mercy kind of escalated um, to where it is now. And I really enjoy the part of figuring out, you know, if other surgeons are having issues, how we can help them navigate that, um, whether they're, they've been here for a while or new surgeons, um, making their lives work better um, for them and for their patients um, has really been a good part of my growth in, in at Mercy. That, you know, that's, to me, sounds really, you know, fulfilling, and it kind of speaks to the partnership, really, of, you know, a, an amazing healthcare system and organization, and then, you know, who, who you know, they're, they are employing and working with from, you know, physician and APP level. Kelly, I'd love, you know, obviously, you you have you originally recruited you know Dr. Gray to work at Mercy and then you know now I know you're you're working with Mercy and on some you know additional searches tell us a little bit more about you know what makes you passionate about you know seeing you know stories like this really well Sylvia is such a uh, prime example of why I love this profession we um watching her come to Oklahoma and integrate herself into the community, um, climb the ranks through Mercy and the impact that she's had, not only on making her own practice hers, but on countless other physicians' practices in her leadership role. It is um, it's very fulfilling for me to know that I played a little bit, a little tiny part. A big part. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, a little tiny part in... Um, in that and the number of patients that she has um, seen and made an impact on their lives in Oklahoma. I have so many friends who have seen her and their kids have seen her and just um, it's really amazing to be a little part of that. Now that I'm on the side of the Pacific, Pacific companies, it's really fun to be working together again. So. Um, in business development, I get to work with physicians like Dr. Gray and the administration team and the internal recruiters to talk with them about their strategy. When I was working for Mercy, not only was I, I was a physician recruiter, but I also um, was an operations manager and helped manage the day-to-day -day operations of our, our specialty clinics. So I think it gives me a little bit of a unique perspective from a business development point of view in the physician recruiting world, because most folks don't understand the inner workings of the they health system yeah. like I do. So now that I'm with Pacific Companies, we've had so many awesome conversations about growth strategies and what, um, you know, even when you're, you know, we have access and insight into market analytics that, um, our clients might not necessarily have because we're seeing what's happening on a number of levels. And, you know, obviously we work in all 50 states. So being able to help kind of provide some of that, even with Mercy so far, we've, we're have we working together again. And there's been some conversations that we've had, you know, where Mercy's like, hey, I think this is what we want. And then we're having conversations after the fact, well, hey, have you considered this or this or this? And maybe you need to be open to, um, looking at other, you know, like maybe a little bit of a broader search or whatever, and we can have these kind of like consultative conversations, mm -hmm. um, which is really fun for me. And it's kind of like all of my worlds coming together. Mm -hmm. And um, it's been really, really fun being on the Pacific Companies team and getting to use that experience. I mean, I really think it's, it's come full circle in the sense that in my leadership role, we talk about growth and strategy very often and what that looks like. And when we're expanding our providers um, and our footprint, you know, talking about recruiting is so important um, and how you recruit um, and then having the kind of insight that a big company like this has. It's also interesting to us because 
you know, we are in four different states, but we don't have a presence in the entire country. And so having the ability to recruit that broadly um, is really helpful for our growth strategies. Um, and then to be able to talk to Kelly about what does this look like? How are other people doing this? Like, how are they being successful? Um, I think has been helpful and, and, and fun. Well, that's, I, I love hearing the story of you guys working together again in a different capacity and, you know, both of you working to solve, you know, really what we have is just, you know, a healthcare crisis with, you know, the shortage of, you know, providers and, and finding ways to, you know, fill those gaps where they're, they're where we really need providers. So um, I think I love, I love this to hear this. Um, Callie, quick question for you, for any healthcare system that may be listening, do you have, you know, kind of one tip or one, you know, kind of strategy you want to just give high level for them to, to think about a bit? I would say get ahead of the game. So a lot of times our clients come to us and they're saying, oh my gosh, we've been recruiting for two years and we have no candidates. And this, our, our only urologist is retiring in three months help. Well, we are behind the curve at that mm-hmm. point, you know? And so I'm always very impressed with our clients who are looking at their growth strategy 18 months out, three years out, looking at retirement planning, succession planning. You know, as you mentioned, Stacy, the physician shortage is here. It's real. It's getting harder and harder to find great physicians and it takes a while to do this. It's um, sometimes we can place, you know, a physician in a month, but a lot of times it takes longer than that to find exactly what our client is looking for. And so really being proactive in that planning strategy is probably my number one tip and also my favorite part of the job. So um, I, that's my favorite thing to do with the client, our clients. Love that. Great tips for, for anybody that's listening uh, that is, you know, obviously in that position of, of staffing for their system or hospital group. Um, Dr. Gray, I want to, you know, end things. I want to hear a little bit about, you know, you're such, you know, a uh, successful, highly, you know, motivated and disciplined person. want to hear just, you know, how, how you really think about this, you know, very, the thing that may not be real work-life balance, but tell us a little bit about that. Um, I think, and I I tell my kids this, they're like, gosh, you work a lot. You know, you're going in the middle of the night or you're going so early. And I'd say, if you don't love your job, it is very hard to do it. Um, I do, I do love my job. I love what I do. Um, sometimes at two in the morning, it feels not amazing, but you know, I, I do think like when I get there, I'm excited to help the person. So it is, um, that I think is the first and foremost. Um, and then I do think this work life balance is a little bit unfair and elusive. I think the idea of you, you can't have and do it all. I mean, it's just not, there's not enough hours in the day. I, um, I delegate a whole bunch of things. Um, I have two amazing uh, physician assistants that I work with in my clinic, and they are invaluable. I mean, they help me when I'm running around doing 12 things. I know that they are there doing all the other things that have to get done to make my clinic work. Um, I have a live-in nanny who I am sure is going to be there if I get called at two in the morning. I'm not worried about what are my children going to do, who is going to be taking care of them. And she's like a consistent person and she is amazing and also invaluable. I mean, um, my parents live here um, and, you know, all the things that happen at three o'clock when the kids get out of school uh, and have to get them to 12 different places. I have a lot of help. And I have a lot of people who love on my children. Um, And, you know, I am also like we were talking about kind of at the beginning, I have a lot of control of my, you know, so if I want to make it to their, you know, during the day play at one o'clock, I block out my schedule and I make that happen. Um, And so even though I have lots of roles and as you kind of go through your 
career, um, you have more say. So like uh, this morning I needed to meet with another physician, um, but you know, I had other things to do today, this afternoon, so forth. And so we met before work. Um, and I, there's, there's a lot of flexibility in life. If, if you make it that way, you know, I said, Hey, I can meet you before let's have a coffee. And so figuring out like, when is it maybe less disruptive in your day? Um, and having good friends that, you know, um, help also, uh, I mean, we do a lot of community uh, taking care of our children. Yeah. Well, you do a really great job of prioritizing the things that bring you joy, like the golf lessons with your boys and things like that. Like, you know, she makes the things time with your friends, like, you know, Dr. Gray, it's weird to call you that. (laughs) Sylvia is um, really, really good at prioritizing her people and delegating the things that don't serve her and bring you joy. You're really good at that. I think that um, one of the things that I love, and I think um, it was Angela Duckworth who said this when I saw her speak, she said, think about having, um, you have glass balls and you have bouncy balls. The glass ball, you you only have 10 glass balls. You can only keep 10 things in the air safely. The rest of them have to be allowed to bounce. So you figure out what those 10 balls are and you do your best to keep them in the air and the rest of them, sometimes you can juggle them and sometimes you cannot. Um, and I, and I, I, I view that as like, I am a terrible cook. I dislike cooking. I will never cook. I go to Callie's house if I want a home cooked meal and you know, and, and that's okay. It's just, you can't, you can't do it. You can't, it is not one of my glass balls, <laughs> you know, but you know, my kids are. And so if that means, you know, having to leave work early or, uh, you know, prioritize their games or so forth. That's one of them. And I'm, and, and you make it happen. That is such a great way to, to end this, um, to, you know, really focusing on the things, you know, that are important and that, that bring you joy and hearing from somebody that is doing it all. And, and so successfully, um, I want to thank you, Dr. Gray, for your time and for all that you do and for all of the people that you serve and, and, you know, really provide amazing outcomes too. And Callie, thank you for your time and all the perspective um, that I think will be really, you know, meaningful for the healthcare systems executives or anyone that's listening. So thank you both. And we would be so delighted to have you on at any time. You're both amazing. Thank you, Stacy. We appreciate your time. Thank you to all of our listeners. If you would like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you would like to be a guest, please go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.